it's all well and good talking about these invasive species, but we actually need to know how do we make them taste good? I mean, who's hungry now that I mention that? Would anyone be interested in eating any of the stuff that, yeah? Oh, yeah. And I would love to hear about how we make them del delicious. So I'd like to welcome um, Adam James and Fiona, Dr. Fiona Kerslake, to the stage, uh, talking about how we actually, what we do and um, how we make them into delicious meals. Now, firstly, Adam James is a Tasmanian-based fermentation guru. He's collaborated with Mona to create a range of preservatives uh, and ferments using invasive animals and plants from Tasmania and beyond. He's turned his passion into a business with rough rice, which I'm sure some of you have heard of, hopefully all of you, which supplies a handful of restaurants, um, not only here but around the country, with fermented condiments from Tasmanian produce. Joining Adam is Dr Fiona Kerslake, who's going to explain the science behind fermentation and she's going to give you a bit of a closer look at how you add water, how you add salt and uh, koji to cane toad to turn this pest into a delectable condiment. Uh, Fiona Kerslake, for those who don't know, is the head of horticulture at the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture uh, and she's got a passion for supporting and developing the local craft cider industry as well. Please make them welcome Adam James and Dr Fiona Kerslake. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me OK at the back? Speak louder. We good? All right. What's that? OK. Hi, Fiona. Hi, Adam. Um, firstly, I guess, I mean, just had the intro, but um, I've been working in uh, fermentation and fermented foods for about six years now. Um, what started as a hobby uh, through, I guess, extensive research and travel has turned into a bit of an obsession. Um, and I've worked with Mona on and off for about three years now, um, particularly with Vince Trim, the head chef out there. Um, so when he came to me with this proposal of um, helping Mona basically create, um, I mean, it wasn't a specific product that, that he was interested in. It was like, we've got this idea. What do you think? What can you make? So for me, it was one of the most challenging um, and I have to say rewarding things I've ever been involved in. Um, it was really a license to get as creative as I possibly could with the techniques which I've kind of learnt um, around the world and applying them to uh, the invasive species. So, um, yeah, it, was, it took weeks of, of planning and brainstorming and then started, yeah, kind of implementing some of these different concepts. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of those today um, and Fiona's going to help me kind of break that down scientifically. Apparently. So, um, first up, uh, here we have the Northern Pacific Sea Star. So I'm sure anyone who's been swimming in the ocean, particularly on the east coast of Tasmania, has probably come across these things. Um, even the Derwent Estuary has some of the highest concentrations in the world. Um, these are a terrible, terrible pest. And, um, you know, it's, it's pretty dire. Like, they are destroying so much of the uh, marine ecosystem. And um, they certainly had to be way up on the list of things to, uh, to address um, in this project. So um, use those in a couple of different ways, but I'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, first up, see if I can work this. So the, the first one I'd like to talk about is Pest O. And you see what I did there? Um, so this is a, it was a condiment made out of, 
fat hen, prickly sow thistle, fumatory, ribwort plantain, and then also um, some blackberry vinegar, which I made on for a different project, also for Mona. Um, so these were all just picked in one day from um, Paulette Whitney's farm. So Paulette was also a massive contributor to the dinner. Um, she took us out foraging for lots of these different um, invasive, particularly herbs. Um, but these all came from her garden, from her actual vegetable patch. Um, so essentially with this one, it was a very simple process. Um, they were all lacto-fermented. Um, whereby they were pretty much just submerged in a, um, a salt brine, about 2% salt brine, and so they were fermented individually, relying on their own bacteria and yeast, um, and then were combined with some, um, had some pepitas and sunflower seeds and the vinegar. So Adam, are these things which would ne uh, normally have been picked out of as weeds and disposed of? Absolutely, 100%. And it, um, and it was, it was actually really quite delicious. Um, it all came together. It had a beautiful colour. Um, got the texture from the seeds, but really, really interesting. It had the, the natural sourness from the, the lacto fermentation. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a really fun little thing to start with. There was another one which I did with the so thistle as well, which is called a gundruk. So a gundruk is a, um, a traditional ferment of Nepal, whereby uh, leaves are kind of pounded with a little bit of salt to release their, I guess, excess water, and then they're buried underground for a couple of weeks. So that's normally done with um, turnip tops or radish tops, but in this circumstance, I did use the sow thistle. And, um, and then you dehydrate it, so you basically leave it out in the sun, and it almost resembles tea. And uh, traditionally, it's used to sprinkle over things, but this, um, yeah, this uh, sow thistle gundruk was, um, was another win as far as yeah, I was concerned. So you're talking about a lacto-ferment, so that's where you get bacteria to do your work for you. Correct. So this is naturally occurring bacteria in the environment. Exactly. Yep, so it's coming in on what you pick out of the garden. Once you crush, it gets to work. Exactly, so yeah, lactobacillus yep. um, is kind of the active agent, I suppose. Um, and so essentially with that, you're trying to create an anaerobic environment um, so in this circumstance, it was going to be in, it was submerged in a salt brine, so it's actually submerged in the water. Um, and as it, as it ferments, it releases off uh, carbon dioxide and, um, and then naturally sours um, and ferments. It makes it extra tasty. Um, so the next one is, uh, there was lots of, using blackberries in, in different ways. We did a blackberry vinegar. Um, we did um, a just lacto-fermented blackberries. Um, and then this one here is um, the blackberries picked quite young. Um, and then they were treated uh, as you would in an umeboshi. So call it blackberry boshi. Um, so this is an old Japanese technique, um, normally done with ume, which is um, well, they call it salted plum, but it's actually a, a relative of the apricot. And um, so we use that same kind of treatment with these green blackberries. Um, and so they had a, a wonderful uh, acidity to them. Um, and then, but they were still quite tough because they were picked quite young. So then from there, we actually dehydrated them. And they had this incredible, so they're quite dry, but little pops of salty acidity. Um, and they were, yeah, they were a, a lot of fun and an interesting technique. So I've got no experience but, uh, uh, with, with the umeboshi, but I've heard of it, haven't tried it. What do you do with the liquid that, you, um, that comes out of this as a result of...? So that um, traditionally is called an umesu, which is uh, a vinegar, actually. So it's like a salty vinegar, and it's absolutely delicious. So it's pretty much zero waste from most of these processes that we go through. So you're taking something which, you know, green blackberries don't, you, you, you can't use them in the cooking, the traditional cooking. Correct, yeah. yeah. But we put it through this process and all of a sudden, whole of crop is being utilised in some way, shape or form. Absolutely, yep. yep. So another, another fun one. Um, so we did really wanted to use camel milk as much as possible, and I know uh, Vince was making uh, 
panna cottas and, and other such things. Um, but we thought a cheese would be really, really interesting. So we, um, we got in a whole heap of camel milk um, and made what we called camelotta. So essentially we made a salted ricotta out of the camel milk um, and then basically put that in a, in a saline solution and aged that for, a, it was just under 10 weeks. Um, and then we finished it by dusting um, with uh, slippery jack mushrooms, which are another, um, you know, invasive fungi, albeit delicious. Um, and so basically we ended up with this beautiful hard camel cheese, um, which we could grate over a couple of the different dishes in different variations. So that was, that was another really interesting, um, yeah, application. Um, I guess the main thing which I brought to the project um, was my experience making garums. And that's um, what we'll move on to next. So um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with garums, um, they, they're often seen as or considered to be the world's oldest condiment. Uh, they, they trace back to pre-Roman times, um, the, the first recorded well, documented um, condiment uh, was from, actually from Tunisia, and then it was believed that the Romans brought that back to, to Rome. Um, but essentially, it's a fish sauce. So it's a naturally fermented fish sauce. Um, it's made by essentially salting down whole fish, including the intestinal tract, which does the fermenting, um, and essentially left in the sun to rot. And then it's this liquid which emerges, um, which is this absolutely delicious, um, albeit back then it was a very unrefined version, um, but fish sauce. And to this day, fish sauce is actually generally made in a similar kind of process, um, but with anchovies. But back in the day, they'd use any fish they could, chop them up, salt them, leave them in barrels, um, and left to ferment. And so... But you have to give them a bit of time before salting, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so there's the proteolytic enzymes that are in the intestinal tract that you've got to let them start to get to work before salting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so basically, this kind of, um, you know, garums have, have suddenly, I guess, become a bit of a, a trendy thing in um, particularly, you know, kind of high-end restaurants, you know, around Europe and the States and, and particularly in the fermenting world. Um, it, it's, all, it's all the talk um, of recent years. Um, so basically, you know, the modern day approach to making garums is you don't necessarily, it doesn't have to be a fish, it can be any protein. So you can use, um, you know, you can use chicken, you can use beef, you can use cane toad, uh, you can use sea urchin. So, and then you're following a particular formula uh, and using what is called um, koji, which is actually a fungus called Aspergillus orze. I'm not sure if that's pronounced correctly. Totally yes. bang on. <laughs> um, and so that is essentially, that is what is doing the fermenting. So that's breaking down the protein into amino acids. Um, and so basically you're mixing protein with this mold koji um, and then salt and then water. And then you're leaving them in controlled conditions um, for you know, eight to 10 weeks. Uh, so that was kind of what I was particularly excited about doing for this project. So, so, so we had a wood roach garum the other week, which was really impressive. And it was amazing how much flavour that you could get out of that because one of the beauties of garum is umami. Exactly. Yeah, so one of those fabulous amino acids uh, really contributes to that umami flavour. That's yeah. right. And, and I kind of, yeah, I, I guess the, the term that I kind of used through this project was essence of animal, uh, which is kind of what it was, particularly at the end when you got to try them all side by side. Because you could really, if you sat there and closed your eyes, you could really differentiate between the different sources, even though they essentially followed the same technique and um, you know, levels. Um, so yeah, here we have the, the rabbit. And you can see it, that's the koji just on the top right. And then that's it being mixed up. Um, all together. So from there, it was essentially, where are we? Uh, so here's, here's the koji. And I'll just give you a, a really 
quick rundown on, on the process of Koji making. So Koji, um, it's, it's found throughout particularly Asia, but also um, in Mexico has been used a fair bit. Um, traditionally, it was found on the rice plant, although it has been found naturally on corn. Um, and it is, it's a bacteria. Um, and it was first discovered thousands of years ago in the production of soy sauce. And it's integral for things like, um, you know, sake, uh, mirin, um, things like brown rice vinegar, soy sauce. Miso. Miso, exactly, exactly. So it's, um, it's an incredible fungus. It was actually declared the national fungus of Japan several years ago. Um, it's really beautiful, isn't it, the way that... You never think that a mould could uh, result in something so delicious, and but it's really beautiful the way that it spreads out with the the hyphae, the way that they grow across the top of the mould, uh, the rice, to create that. Exactly, it's yeah. it's one of the most rewarding things that I do, I guess, on a professional capacity, um, and the, the smell is absolutely intoxicating. Um, so, and and just what it can do in, in breaking down protein is is quite incredible. Um, so, so with this, um, you know, this one is the carrot. Uh, we also did, we had rabbit. We had uh, the Northern Pacific sea star, which we talked about before. Um, the long spine sea urchin. So I actually jumped in the water and collected a whole heap of those um, up the east coast. Uh, we wild goat, wild boar, uh, brumby, and wild deer. So we had all of these. Um, ferment, fermenting simultaneously, um, and there you go. There's the uh, the long spine sea urchin, and so that was pretty much like the end result of that was essentially like a fish sauce. So it um you know it was delicious. It was actually really tasty, and you know to actually have a use for these horrible pests that you know if there was a way that we could, you know, harvest them en masse and actually produce something that's really delicious, you know. With and we've got a use for the, uh, for, the, for the waste. So for the leftover, we're looking at converting that into uh, fertiliser. Is that right? So to bring it back around again. So, Amazing. yeah, we've been uh, rolling it out into some more broad-scale agriculture, um, but a good way to deal with the pest and bring it back into the loop. 100%. And so, I mean, yeah, something needs to be done to address this kind of issue. Um, so for those who have their little pens and paper out, the, the, my garum recipe, if anyone wants to give it a whirl at home. <laughs> um, so to, to one of your, to one kilo of protein, which you want to basically essentially mince up, um, you're looking at about 230 grams of salt, 800 grams of water. I got all of my water from Kunyani, so I got it straight off the mountain. Um, and then you'll have 200 grams of inoculated koji rice. Um, so this was fermented at about 58 degrees for 10 weeks. And in that time, if we've still got... You can kind of see it on the C star one, how it does kind of split. And so that's, that's essentially what we're looking for. And then after those 10 weeks, um, we're just straining them off. And um, there you have it. There's your invasive species garum. Which is seriously one of the most delicious condiments that I've ever had. So I haven't tried some of your invasive species garums, but it's, it's again, it's just that umami flavour which mm. just really ha has you going back for more. Like the glutamate in there, like everyone knows about MSG and it's the glutamate in that that makes it so moorish. Exactly. And that's where the umami really comes into the garum. It's like a, yeah, a naturally occurring... Glutamate. It's almost, some of them had a little bit of a kind of a Vegemite kind of thing going on. They were very strong, very strong um, flavours, so you only need the smallest amounts. Um, but yeah, hugely rewarding, and yeah, I can't thank Mona enough for giving me the opportunity to come and play. And that's it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. Dr. Fiona Kerslake and Adam James, uh, amazing presentation. I want to open it up to questions. Has anyone got a burning question for either of these guys that they would li like to ask? And I can take the mic to you. Anyone? Oh, I've got one right down the back. 
Do you want to make me halfway? I'm coming. Wait, where's he gone? Oh, here you are. Come, come over here. Oh, all right, no, you're coming out. Okay, here we go. Uh, hey, Adam. Um, you were saying that everything kind of on the, uh, on the board here was quite delicious. Did you have any really, uh, anything that turned out got awful? Um, did anything tasting. turn out awful? Tasting, obviously, yeah. Um, out of the garums or in general? There was, um, I think it was the, the ribwort plantain. I did a separate batch of that, and I tried to do it with essentially no salt um, and kind of just put it in the back of the cupboard and kind of forgot about it, and that was a complete disaster, yeah. Was it really yeah. bitter? It wasn't so much bitter. It was, it was more a textural thing. Um, it had gone just really slimy, and um, it just... Yeah, it, it was gone. Textures was, are really important part is, and, of and taste. And I'm, I'm all for variance in texture. Like, I, I love the slimy, I love the challenging, but um, this, was, this was no good. There's slimy and then there's that just coating. Like. Exactly, exactly. Okay, anyone else? One last question. Anyone want to ask a, another secret recipe from Adam James? Oh, yep. To, to someone who cannot even imagine what these things taste like, apart from, say, an Asian fish sauce, okay, or soy sauce, can you describe what the difference in taste would be to us between cane toad garum and sea star garum? Well, the, um, the, they all certainly had... Uh, I mean, you could definitely taste, I guess, more the, the red meat kind of based ones as opposed to... The, the cane toad was actually remarkably subtle. It was one of my favourites. The cane toad and the rabbit were my two favourites. Subtle, yeah. Where the um, things like the boar and the deer were really bold and, um, yeah, like really full. Uh, the, the sea star and the sea urchin were both um, very, very different again. And you could tell that they were just in... You, you could taste the sea as well, I suppose. Um, so they did have a bit more of that fish sauce kind of finish. Um, yeah, I, I found, if anything, I found the, the, you know, the deer and the boar, etc. they were almost too strong for my palate and had to be kind of mixed or you know, let out a little bit with um, things like olive oil or, or vinegar, that type of thing. Yeah. Can I ask Adam a question? Do you blend all your garums or do you um, separate liquid and solids? And if you separate the solids, what do you do with the solids? Um, do I blend them at the, at the start? At the, at the, at the end, because some garums are really thick yeah. and then some are almost clear sauce-like. Yeah, no, I, I prefer the clear sauce, so I just strain mine off. And the solids, some went into my compost, um, and some just got disposed of. The amazing compost. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. Give it up for Dr. Fiona Kerslake and Adam James. <laughs>